Hello. I'm very happy to be here. And um, I'm getting just this giant surge of energy just from being with, with, with everybody that's here this morning. So thank you. I thought I'd begin by talking about how I got the idea to write Happier at Home and then throw out a bunch of practical, realistic, manageable resolutions for you to think about if you want to think about your own Happier at Home project. And do not worry, these are all things that don't take a lot of time, energy, or money, because nobody has any extra time, energy, or money. I got the idea to write Happier at Home in a very inconspicuous moment of my life. I was standing in my own kitchen, unloading the dishwasher. I could hear my husband in the next room watching golf on television, and my two daughters were playing restaurant. And I was hit by an enormous wave of homesickness. I felt the way I felt when I went to summer camp for the first time. And this feeling was so puzzling to me, because why would I be feeling homesick if I was standing right in the middle of my own home? I realized it was as if suddenly I had been transported 30 years into the future and was looking back with yearning at what I had right now and right here. This feeling was so strong and so puzzling to me that it got me to focus for the first time on the idea of home. Because I'd been researching and writing and thinking about happiness for years, but I'd never really focused on this idea of home. I realized that for me, and I think for many people, home is really the foundation of a happy life. It's hard to be happy if you're not happy at home. I decided I wanted to do another happiness project, and this time I was really going to go very deeply and focus on these issues that related to home. Things like time, neighborhood, family, marriage, parenthood, body, and really focus on what I could do to make my life happier at home. But before I did that, there was a kind of a gateway question that I had to face about the nature of happiness. And if you've thought about your own happiness project, I'm sure you've asked yourself this question as well. And that's whether it's selfish to want to be happy. Happiness has a surprisingly bad reputation. Um, some people assume that happy people are stupid or smug, or superficial. But in fact, research shows, and I think if you think about the people in your own life, you'll really see this borne out by your own experience, that happy people are more interested in the people around them, and more interested in the problems of the world. They're more altruistic. They give away more money. They volunteer more time. They're more likely to help out if a friend or a family member or a colleague needs a hand. They're healthier, and they have healthier habits. They make better team members and better leaders. When we're unhappy, we tend to become isolated, defensive, and preoccupied with our own problems. When we're happy, we have the emotional wherewithal to turn outward and to think about other people and the problems of the world. So if it is selfish to want to be happy, we should be selfish if only for selfless reasons. So once you decide that you want to be happy and you decide that you want to try to be happier at home, where do you start? It can feel challenging because happiness can seem very transcendent and abstract and everything's tangled up with everything else. So where do you begin? I think a great place to start is with your own body because your physical experience is always going to color your emotional experience. And the first thing I'm going to say is so basic that you will want to laugh, but it has to be said. And in particular, to a group like you, I'm confident it needs to be repeated. In order to be happy, you need to resolve to get enough sleep. How many people here regularly get seven hours of sleep? OK, not every hand is up. How many people here regularly use the snooze button? Oh, no. Terrible, terrible snooze button. Many adults are chronically sleep deprived. And you'll talk to people and they'll say, oh, well, I've trained myself 
to get by on five hours of sleep. But when scientists study these people, they are quite impaired. A lack of sleep affects your mood, your memory, your immune function, your focus. They even think it contributes to weight gain. In order to be happier, it's very important to turn off the light and get enough sleep. By the same token, it's very important to get some exercise. You do not need to train for the marathon. You do not need to do an hour spin class. This is something like going for a 10 or 20 minute walk outside, especially if you can go outside, because just being in the sunshine is going to give you that boost of mood and energy. A lot of people think that exercise, they're too tired to exercise. But in fact, exercise tends to boost energy and not deplete energy. So feeling tired is a reason to exercise, not a reason to skip exercise. But here is a secret tip. Let's say you're having a happiness emergency, and it's 3 o'clock, and you're dragging, and you don't have time to take a nap, and you don't have time to go out for a walk. So what can you do to give yourself a quick fix right now? All you have to do is jump up and down, especially if people can see you. There's something about getting both feet off the ground. It's childlike. It's energetic. It's kind of goofy. It will give you that quick boost of energy. If you do jumping jacks next to your, your desk, skip around the room, run down the stairs, hop over a puddle, just this little gesture can really give you a lift. The third thing I would say to consider as you're thinking about your body and being happier at home is one of my new resolutions and one of my very favorite resolutions. And that's the resolution to embrace good smells. And smell is an interesting feature of our experience because smell is something that if you don't pay attention to it, it just fades into the background and you hardly notice it. But if you turn your attention to it, it can become a much more salient part of your experience. And what I found is that just by paying attention to these smells, I get so much more pleasure from them. And just, it's something that's very much present if we decide to allow it to, to be experienced. So you can walk through the kitchen and pick up a grapefruit and enjoy that smell. You can bury your face in a freshly laundered pile of towels. You can walk into a hardware store and think, why is it that wherever you go, anywhere in the country, a hardware store has that hardware store smell? It's a mystery, but I love that hardware store smell. Another thing that I love about smell is it is a pleasure for which we, we pay no price. Because there's so many pleasures that if you enjoy them, you have to pay some kind of cost. So you can eat a chocolate chip cookie, but you've got to count the calories. And you can go to a museum, but you've got to buy a ticket. You can read a book, but you have to have the time and the mental focus in order to appreciate the book. But with the smell, it's just a quick instant, and then you move on. The next area I would suggest thinking about as you're thinking about how to be happier at home is the area of possessions. Not because I think that possessions are the most important element of your life in relationship to your happiness, because clearly they're not. But there does seem to be something about possessions that can weigh us down and make us feel overwhelmed and paralyzed. And dealing with possessions can give us the energy to deal with more significant resolutions that are maybe more challenging. And as I've studied the relationship between possessions and happiness, I've been struck by two things. The first is that for most people, possessions do have an important role to play in a happy life. And this, this is surprisingly controversial. A lot of people want to argue that possessions don't matter at all. Less is more. Simplicity is everything. I'd be happier if I just got rid of it all. We don't want to feel materialistic. We don't want to feel preoccupied with buying stuff and getting stuff and keeping stuff. And so we just sort of say, well, possessions aren't important. But in fact, I think possessions are important. 
They allow us to project our identity into our environment. They serve as important reminders of the people and activities and places that we love. And in fact, one of my aims for my Happier at Home project was to try to get more happiness from the possessions that were important to me. So one of the resolutions that I followed in order to try to get more happiness from my possessions was the resolution to cultivate a shrine. And by a shrine, I mean a place of super engagement in my apartment. So one of the things about me, just idiosyncratic to me, is that I am like this crazy fanatic for children's literature and young adult literature. I read it as a child, but I still read it now as an adult, all the time. And I have many, many works of children's literature and young adult literature all over my apartment. But it was scattered. Some was in one bedroom, one daughter's bedroom, some was in another daughter's bedroom, some was in our bedroom, some was just, you know, like in a pile, you know, in, in a corner because I didn't know what else to do with them for years. Um, so what I did, I went around the apartment, gathered up all these books, put them in a giant pile, cleared off a big bookshelf, alphabetized these books and arranged them nicely, and I put with them some mementos that I associate with children's literature, like my giant stack of Cricut magazines. I don't know if anybody else had Cricut growing up, but I read and reread these magazines countless times. I still have every single Cricut magazine that I ever owned, and just seeing them on the shelf makes me so happy. The thing about it is, I don't own anything that I didn't own before. But by taking the time to mindfully arrange these things, I get so much more happiness from them. I'm just thrilled when I'm in that part of the apartment in a way that I never was before. Another thing that has really struck me about the relationship of possessions to happiness is the almost weird degree to which, for most people, outer order contributes to inner calm more than it seems like it should. In the context of a happy life, something like a crowded coat closet or a, an overflowing inbox or a messy medicine cabinet is trivial. Clearly, it's trivial. And yet, I experience myself, and over and over, people tell me that they experience the same thing themselves. That there's something about getting control over the stuff of life that makes you feel more in control of your life generally. And if this is an illusion, it is a helpful illusion. In fact, whenever I talk to people about their happiness projects, I say, well, what did you try? What, did, what worked for you? And I hear about dozens and dozens and dozens of resolutions that people try. Some people follow the one minute rule. So if anything can be done in less than a minute, they do it without delay, and that works for them. Some people do the evening tidy up, where you take 15 to 20 minutes every night and just tidy up, and that works for them. Some people go shelf by shelf and just deal with one little thing that's right in front of them and pick away at, at the disorder. And of course, there are millions and millions of resolutions not even related to clutter that people follow. But the number one resolution that people specifically mention to me as something that they do and that does boost their happiness on a daily basis and again, I am not saying this is the most significant change you can make in your life to be happier. I'm just saying it seems to be a kind of gateway drug to a happiness project. Is the resolution to make your bed. How many people here regularly make their bed? Okay, how many people here regularly make their bed in a hotel room on the morning they check out? Yes, okay, we will talk later. There is something about this action of making your bed. It's, it's small, but it's that little bit of order, that first step 
um, in the day of creating an atmosphere of serenity that really seems to be helpful to people. But the thing about clutter is that it is so tough because you put everything away and then it just gets messed up again. You clear everything out and then there's just this tide of stuff coming into your house all the time. So what do you do? And I have many, many resolutions that are aimed at trying to stop clutter and resist clutter. So I was going through my apartment and I was looking for things. Um, I was looking, examining all my possessions and, and putting them to the test. And my test is, do we use it? Do we need it? Do we love it? And if we didn't use it, need it, or love it, we should probably toss it, recycle it, or give it away. So I was subjecting all of my possessions to this test. And I came across this curious class of possessions that I had not recognized before. And I, at first I thought this was just my private pathology, but it turns out that a lot of people have this issue too. And these are possessions that I would describe as being related to a stalled project. So there is some project that was begun by me or some, another member of my family, and for some reason it did not move through to completion. Either it wasn't as fun as we thought it would be, or it was too hard, or it took too many moving parts that nobody could be bothered to assemble, but for whatever reason, it had gotten stuck. In particular, one class that I saw was related to origami. We had many, many origami kits in our house, and we got some as gifts, and I'm sure I bought some origami kits, and I had this fantasy of how lovely it would be. My daughters and I would sit at the table making paper cranes or whatever, and it would be this lovely thing to do. But it, that was the fantasy. In fact, I don't like origami. I, it never works. Uh, it's frustrating. My daughters get very, get very frustrated with it too. We weren't going to do the origami. I went around the apartment, gathered up all the origami sets, and gave them to my, the art department at my daughter's school. They were thrilled to get all this beautiful paper, and I got the origami kits off my shelves and off my conscience. And since I started talking about this resolution to abandon a project, to let go of these stalled projects, I've heard from people who have abandoned projects like knitting projects, scrapbooks related to a trip to Spain that happened five years ago, um, learning to make beer in the bathtub, um, planting a rose garden. You know, it's very helpful to admit that these projects are not going to be completed, abandon the project, take those possessions, and let them live a long and happy life with someone else and out of your own house. But the last area I want to talk about how to be happier at home is really a much, much more significant area of life to think about. Ancient philosophers and contemporary scientists agree that a key, and probably the key, to a happy life is strong relationships with other people. To be happy, we have to have enduring intimate relationships. We need to be able to confide. We need to feel like we belong. We need to be able to get support, and just as important for happiness, give support. So anytime you're thinking about how to spend your precious time, energy, or money, something that deepens your existing relationships or broadens your relationships is something that's very likely to make you happier. Now, in my case, to be happier at home, I was looking at the relationships that, in my situation, are in my home. Now, this would be different for everybody, because everybody's got a different home situation. But for me, it was about my marriage and my children. And Tolstoy said that happy families are all alike. Now, that's debatable, but it's thought-provoking. I asked myself, what, what are the qualities that I see that happy families share? It struck me that one of the things that happy families share is they tend to have festive traditions and fun rituals, and this helps bring people together in a happy way. So I wanted to have more fun traditions in my home, but I also wanted to be realistic, because the fact is I don't like shopping. I don't like errands. 
I don't have any free time. And my knees are already buckling under the combined weight of the Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas season, which is terrifyingly upon us now. So I had to think of a way to have fun traditions, but to do it in a way that I could manage. I hit upon the resolution, by stealing the idea from a friend, to celebrate holiday breakfasts. So in our home, for minor holidays like Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, Leap Day, we have a holiday breakfast. I, first thing in the morning before anybody's up, I put out some plates, a centerpiece, usually some candy, because my daughters are young enough to get an illicit pleasure from candy for breakfast, and my secret weapon of a holiday breakfast, food dye. Major production value with the food dye. It doesn't take any time or money or energy. I dyed the milk pink, I dyed the scrambled eggs green, I dyed the peanut butter black, and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> the thing about a holiday breakfast is we're all together because nobody's left for the day. I take a picture, we have a fun moment, and it's over. It's easy, it's fun, and it's manageable. The last resolution that I want to mention is an exception. And I'll, this is the reason why it's an exception. One of the sad truths about happiness is that the only person you can change is yourself. It's very tempting to think, I would be happier if other people would behave properly. And to come up with a long list of resolutions for other people to follow. But unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. The only person you can change is yourself. But what I found is that when I change, a relationship changes. And when I change, the atmosphere of my home changes. So I could make larger changes by just focusing on myself. That's absolutely true, but I made one exception for this resolution. I sat down with, at breakfast one morning with my family, and I said, I think we've fallen into a bad habit. I've noticed that when people come and go from the apartment, no one's paying enough attention. We all just grunting out, like, oh, um, without looking up from our newspapers or our books or our homework or our iPads or our phones or whatever, and nobody's paying attention to each other. I really wanted to have an attentive, tender atmosphere in my home. And so I said, what can we do about it? To my surprise, I have to admit, my family knew exactly what I was talking about, and we all agreed that we were gonna give warm greetings and farewells. Now, every time somebody comes or goes from the apartment, everybody gets up, goes to that person, gives them a hug or a kiss or whatever, and has a little exchange with them. And it is amazing to me how much this very small change has altered the atmosphere of my home. It didn't take a lot of time, doesn't, didn't even take a lot of nagging. People very, we all very quickly got into the habit of doing it and expecting it. In fact, the resolution was so successful that I decided to push it even a little further with my husband and to resolve to kiss him in the morning and kiss him at night. And I acknowledge that it's a little preposterous to have a kissing schedule, but one thing I've learned about myself is if it's not on the calendar, it's not gonna get done. And this is my husband, not my roommate. I want to shower him with kisses. And by making a resolution to make sure that I'm doing the things that are gonna create that kind of atmosphere, that kind of tender, romantic atmosphere that I want, I make sure that I'm doing everything that I can to bring that about. So the last thing I would say is, now having done two happiness projects myself, I really do believe that just about anyone can benefit from this, going through this kind of process. Because to take the time to think about your own nature, your own values, and your own interests, and how to bring those elements into your everyday life is something that can make you happier. So thank you. <laughs>